Hello everyone, welcome back. History with Hilbert, your host as always. And today I want to talk to you about Anglo-Saxon shields. Now the reason I'm making this video is one, because I think you'll find it very interesting. And two, because in my very first video that I uploaded almost a year ago now, um, which was a response to Lindy Beige's response to a series called The Last Kingdom, I've been having a lot of comments concerning what I said about Anglo-Saxon shields. And I thought I'd make this video so that I can clear up what I said about that answer so that I can uh, maybe inform some of the people who are asking questions about it um, in a video response rather than replying to everyone individually on there. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you maybe go and have a look at that one um, so that you can see you know, my response to Lindy Beige about The Last Kingdom if you're interested in that kind of thing. And another quick note before I dive in here, that although this video is specifically talking about the Anglo-Saxon practices of shield making and shield use, it's likely going to be true for a lot of the people of Northern Europe at this time period, as well as the Norse, who we now call the Vikings. They all had very similar techniques for making shields and how they used them. So, you know, it's, it's quite a modular one. Um, many of the Northern European peoples would have used these sorts of practices when making shields. Now, okay, before we get started, I'm going to have a look at some of the old English words uh, related with shields. Now, the first one is board. And a fun fact is that um, board, as well as meaning uh, shield in Old English, it actually meant table in Old English, and it means table in modern Norwegian as well. Now, the second one here is rant, which um, was specifically the shield edge, just as it means edge in modern Dutch as well. And schuld. Now, uh, schuld uh, is where we get the modern English word shield from. Obviously, the spellings changed a bit, but in Old English, the SC was pronounced like the modern English SH. And finally, this word lind. And lind is a nice one because it brings me nicely on to my next point. Now, lind actually comes from the linden tree because a lot of the Anglo Saxon shields were made from lime wood, which is another way of saying linden wood. Um, they were, a lot of them were made out of lime wood, as I said, but also out of poplar trees uh, and poplar wood. And the reasons for all this are that lime wood isn't too heavy as woods go, but it is a tough wood. It's got a dense structure um, and it's quite an easy wood to work with. You know, you can shape it, which is exactly what you want when you're trying to get um, trying to build a shield. Because if the wood's too hard to work with, you obviously you can't get it into the right shape that you want for it. You can't do with it um, what you want for getting the strongest possible shield. And poplar was often chosen for shields as well by the Anglo-Saxons because it's like oak in many ways. It's a strong wood with large durability, but it's considerably less heavy than oak, which is why poplar wood is a better choice than oak because it, obviously if your shield is too heavy, if the wood is too heavy that you're making your shield from, the poor guy carrying with it and parrying enemy blows with it is going to be absolutely knackered a few minutes into the battle. So you generally want the strongest possible wood that is also the lightest so that your guy can carry on fighting with it for as long as possible without getting tired, making a mistake, not holding your shield up and then being cleaved in half by a Danax. So once they'd felled the trees, the Anglo-Saxons also employed a couple of different techniques for constructing their shields. Now one of these that they, they would use the opposite grain in the wood, and this helps it um, the, the wood in the shield become stronger. Because if you have it all in the same direction, it's also easier to split the shield as well. And basically, if someone can split your shield, it's useless to you. That shield is of no more use to you at all. So you want to stop this happening at all costs, which is why they had the opposite grain in the wood. Now, another thing that they did was that they used actually two layers of planks and they placed these at 90 degrees. And this is also, again, to stop the shield splitting, to stop the wood in the shield splitting. And again, for this same reason, they'd often put cloth in the middle of these two layers and stick it down with fish or cheese oil. Um, and around the outside, what they would do is that they would have a rawhide or leather rim. And the reason for this is to stop an enemy from being able to see where the planks were. Because if you think about it, you know, you've got a shield basically made out of planks. And if you're coming along with your, I don't know, your sword or your axe, and axes really are basically uh, shield smashers. And, and I know that sounds like a kenning, a name for a Viking axe, but that's literally what they were. Because if you can see where the planks are, you can, 
you can whack your axe into that gap and cut right through the top of someone's shield and break it. And as I said earlier, you know, a split shield is useless. You want it to retain um, its uh, wholeness because if it's broken, well, you can't use it anymore. People are just going to go straight through it. So the reason they have this rim around the outside is so that a, people can't hack through the shield and B, people can't see the planks where they where they meet so that they can slot an axe in there and break the shield. Now, after you've done this, what you would generally do is you'd put an iron shield boss in the center of your shield. And the reason they do this is that the center is generally the weakest place if you strike the shield. And um, this shield boss, obviously, well, one, it makes it harder to hit the center because there's this bloody big boss in the way. And secondly, it deflects blows away from the center so that they deflect off the shield boss, hit somewhere in the shield, and then obviously your enemy's weapon is out of the way. It's just hit the shield and then you can go on and attack them. Now, um, another reason that they put the shield boss in is because it's a good place to put the handle on the reverse side, as you can see here. Um, and often these would be either the full lengths of the shield, as you can see here in this image, that the handle it sort of extends all the way down, obviously with the, the hole where you put your hand where the boss is on the other side, but that they either extend right the way down or that they're very small. And this is again to do with the different styles of shield and different distribution of force when the shield is being struck by an enemy's weapon. And as well as this, they would then um, go on to add a leather cover over the top. And then obviously, as I said earlier, they'd put the rim in place so that the enemy can't see where the planks are, so that they can't smash the shield. Now, although um, none have been found, uh, social evidence from the time suggests that convex shields were also in use. And it's a term I'm going to be using from now on. And convex basically means this sort of curved shield. So as you can see in this picture, you have um, a shield, but then sort of the sides, they slope inwards, if you will, so that it's more of a, a curved shape. And this has a few advantages. Now, the way that they would make these curved convex shields is by using steam and this steam gets into the wood and the wood then bends. And obviously, if you control that, you can control it so that you get this nice domed shape on your shield. And one of the reasons this was done was to stop an enemy from hooking your shield. Um, and hooking a shield is, as, I, as you can see on the screen here, is where an enemy axe would go over the top of a shield then clamp into position and then an enemy can wrench your shield away from you. And obviously if an enemy wrenches your shield away, well, you've just lost your main, you, you know, often your only form of defense. And then, you know, in a tight shield wall formation, well, the guy on the other side with that ball spear, you know, he's plunged straight through you. Your shield is the only thing that's keeping you alive in Anglo-Saxon warfare. So basically if someone hooks your shield, then they can control your shield. They can rip your shield away from you. Um, and that leaves you vulnerable and then you're probably dead if someone does this. And the good thing about having a convex shield is, well, even this weapon, which is called a Viking bearded axe because it looks like a beard. Um, and the, the whole point of this weapon is to hook away an enemy shield. The point of a convex shield is it's got this curve. So one, the, you have to reach right in with the axe to get over the rim of the shield whereas on just a normal straight one as you can see in the top you don't have to do that and by reaching straight in you expose your hand now someone your buddy next to you i don't know ekbert he can reach over with his axe and then cut that guy's hand off so it's more dangerous for someone to try and hook a convex shield and as well as this it's harder to manipulate if they would for instance hook your convex shield well it's got this curve on it you need a lot more power a lot more force to pull this shield away and as well it's easier to control for the guy on the other side you know whose convex shield it is to control and regain control from the guy who's tried to hook his shield. And obviously it's harder to pull um, the shield out and pull the person out from the shield wall. So it's also a safer option. But it's also likely that convex shields um, were rarer because obviously we haven't found as many. And that they might have been more of a um, like a status symbol. Like the, the higher up warriors, the Huskarls would have had one of these. As you can see in the picture here, this guy is clearly wearing um, a cape. He's wearing full mail and he has a sword as well as a Danax, so it's very likely that he is a Huskarl, a uh, house call in English. Um, so it might have been something that only the more the higher up warriors could afford. Now it's very unlikely that the Anglo-Saxons would have left their shields bare, and, and when I say bare, as I meant in the other video, if you've watched that one, I mean um, without paint on them rather than without a leather cover on them or a cloth cover on the front. Um, that they would have left their, their shields unpainted unless in time 
of real urgency. And to paint a shield, what you would first need is a dye, you know, a dye from often vegetables, things like that. And then you can mush that in, make it more liquidy. I know I'm using very technical terms here. I'm sorry about that. But uh, and then you can make the paint from these dyes. And the colours that were most readily available to um, the Anglo-Saxons were whites, reds and blacks. So these colours appear most and I would imagine they would appear the most on uh, in an Anglo-Saxon shield wall as well, because obviously these are the colours that are closest to hand every warrior would generally provide their own shield so this is how i imagine um the most most shields would be painted and white they would make from things like chalk for example red dye you get from different lichens uh, that are found around and about in the uk and other places and black from things like oak wood uh, i'm not entirely sure what the process of making black dye from oak wood would be but i think it's something to do with the bark and then um, i think burning it getting some form of charcoal then that would be a common way of getting black dye and now the paints themselves, they all come from different sources as well. So um, for red paint, you can get that from red lichens, from uh, Calo Placa Marina, which is orange sea lichen, from red ochre and carmine. There are lots of ways to get red, which is also why it's one of the most common. Now, um, yellow you could get from arsenic trioxide. Don't ask me what that is. I have no idea. Uh, egg yolks and orpiment as well as others. Uh, black you could get from, as I said, charcoal and lamp black, which is a type of substance you can get from soot. Greens from things like nettles, other vegetables as well, and copper salts. Uh, whites from things like chalk, ground bone ash, uh, and gypsum as well. And then blue from uh, copper carbonates and other copper sulfates. Uh, and brown from things like walnut shells, other nut shells, I'd imagine, and tannin, which uh, for which the roots are used to make this brown dye. Now, in the Norse tradition of the Holmgang, which is this duel between two people, uh, basically a fight to the death, we know that they each man would take three shields to the Holmgang in expectation that they would break at least two of them each before one of them comes off as the victor. And this just goes to show how easily these shields were broken and how they treated shields as well, that you know they knew that they would easily break, which is why they brought three each to this duel. And it also goes to show you know why we might not find as many because they broke so easily. I'm not sure why our man here is deciding to wear his best cape on his fight to the death though. Seems like a bad idea. Um, and the reason why we don't know much about the shields is because, well, we haven't really found many. We haven't really found many Anglo-Saxon shields at all. And from the early period of the migrations and, you know, a few hundred years into the Anglo-Saxon period, the only ones that we know and what I'm going off in this video were found in Denmark. So across the sea, they weren't even found in England. Although having said that, 25% of uh, male Anglo-Saxon graves did contain shields, well, ha do contain shields, as in the ones we found. Um, but obviously, wooden things, they rot, so we're not quite sure. And that's one of the reasons as well, is because, well, when a shield breaks, when a shield splits, as they often did, as is demonstrated by how many shields were taken to the Holmgang in preparation for the breakages, um, well, yeah, you know... Well, a broken shield, it will start rotting away. And also, shields were given down the line from father to son as heirlooms and things. So they get recycled rather than being buried all the time with other items like, I don't know, an axe, which is why we find far more of those than we find of shields. And as well as this, if you think, you know, cold climate, Anglo-Saxon England, you've got a broken shield, y you, everyone knew how to make one, every man knew how to make a shield, you know, they were fairly good word workers, everyone, and, and everyone knew how to make things from leather, how to tan leather and how to use that, so, you know, y you didn't need a specialist, apart from for the boss where you needed a blacksmith, you didn't need someone special to make you a shield, so when a shield breaks, you know, it, you can just chuck it on the fire, it's good firewood. Which is also why I don't think we find so many, because, well, a broken shield, people would just put it on their fire, you know, put it in their hearth to heat the household, because why not? It's good, it's recycling. And yeah, for, the, for that reason, and for the reason that obviously wood rots and things, um, we don't find very many Anglo-Saxon shields, which is why we have this lack of evidence for Anglo-Saxon shields. Although in this video, obviously, I've used other sources like uh, Norse shields, 
and shields from Denmark at the time of the Anglo-Saxons, as well as social information, for example, uh, with things like the convex curved shields. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. This has been my video on Anglo-Saxon shields. I really hope you've enjoyed this one. As I said, it's a bit of a response to some comments that I've had on my um, response to Lindy Beige's response to The Last Kingdom. I'll be posting it on there as well, so hopefully some people from there can see it as well. Now, please do let me know if you've enjoyed this video. Give me a comment below, and uh, if you have any more questions, please don't hes hesitate to get in touch, and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Now, this is the, ooh, I think it's day four or five of the history with hilbert christmas gifts in which i upload a video every day in the run-up to christmas there will be another one tomorrow um so yeah thanks very much for watching i hope you enjoyed today's video and you, that you will enjoy tomorrow's video as well please don't forget to like comment and subscribe this is history with hilbert signing off